Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper. Just a reminder, this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to discuss your concerns. You can find my books on Amazon, my videos are on YouTube, or you can listen to my podcast, Life Without Baggage, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Now here is an excerpt from my latest book. So first I want to start off with some definitions, then I want to explain how this affects people, and then um, some ideas about what you can do if you find yourself in any of these descriptions. Now, when I use the term learned helplessness, I want to read you a definition from Medical News Today. And the definition used there is learned helplessness is a state that occurs after a person has experienced a stressful situation repeatedly. They come to believe that they are unable to control or change the situation, so they do not try even when opportunities for change become available. Learned helplessness leads to increased feelings of stress and depression. So that's the end of what I'm quoting out of that article. So classic learned helplessness has a number of features and it's associated with a variety of clinical issues that I'm not gonna get into. But the average person can develop problems related to um, aspects of learned helplessness where it shows up in um, just irritating, problematic levels of depression or stress, being overly passive when it comes to solving life's challenges, feeling chronically overwhelmed, or feeling stuck, stuck in a relationship, stuck in a job, or just feeling trapped in general. So if you've lived with a highly stressful family, an abusive partner, chronic social injustice, chronic physical conditions, now you may be a very strong person, but even strong people start to be affected when they are exposed to things month after month, even year after year of things that don't move. And again, um, this can lead to a sense of dread or helplessness when things go wrong, a loss of hope that things can ever change. It, it can lead to seeing yourself as damaged compared to other people. And as I mentioned, a passive rather than a proactive approach to dealing with the stresses of life or work or relationships. So for many people, these symptoms are just sort of in the background and they go undetected in a, just a low level of stress or frustration or low level depression. I wanna give you another example from the animal kingdom. And maybe you know that the way that they train baby elephants to stay in one place is that when they're little, they just tie them to a post. And over time, they realize that they can't get free from the post. So they stay in a, in a small area. And eventually, when they're grown up, they can still be kept in one place just by tying the rope around their leg with nothing anchored to the rope. They've learned to accept the, the constrictions. So let's talk about the science behind learned helplessness. Uh, the research around learned helplessness started with the work of Dr. Martin Seligman, and he first did studies with dogs. In 1967, he was studying topics related to depression, looking at the effects of electric shock on dogs in metal cages. Now, let me let me tell you, nowadays, there are much stricter rules on what you can do um, in regards to animal research. So I'm not saying this was a good idea or the best way to do this. I'm just reporting to you what happened. And you might want to go to the next section if you think this is going to bother you. So the dogs were placed in three groups. Each dog was paired with another animal and they were in a harness together. To explain it simply, the first group 
did not receive any shocks at all. The second group, the animals received a shock that could be stopped by pressing a lever. So they had control over the shocks, they could stop it. But in the third group, each dog was paired with an animal from the second group. When the shock was delivered, only the lever for the group two dogs could stop the shock. So in group three, one dog had control and the other did not. So one of the dogs in each pair for group three was helpless. So in the next phase of the study, the dogs were placed in a chamber that had two compartments. The compartments were separated by a, a little barrier. It was just a couple of inches high. And in this part of the study, all of the dogs could escape from the shock if they just jumped over that little barrier on one side of the chamber to get to the other side of the chamber where there wasn't any shock. And maybe you can guess what happened. The dogs from group one, who had never been shocked, and the dogs from group two, who had control over the shock, learned pretty quickly to jump over that barrier to get to the safe side of the chamber. But the dogs in group three, who had been shocked without any control, did not learn to jump. They stayed on the floor waiting for it to end. And let me tell you, there were efforts made to help those dogs in group three learn to help themselves to jump over that barrier. But what you can see from this is that there is an impact when a living creature repeatedly endures unrelenting stress, even if the stress comes and goes over time. So you can probably see how certain symptoms of being passive, depressed, giving up, or procrastinating can originate in human beings. So as you see, you can train animals and you can train people to be passive and helpless. Now it won't work on everyone, but this is the trend. So why am I sharing this? I think the more that you understand any situations that you've been through that have worn you down, worn you out, uh, changed your view of yourself, or made you overly um, suspicious of people, then that isn't good for you. And it's going to interfere with you fully living your life in the future and examining your options. So on a positive note, educators and psychologists have tried to implement strategies with children and with adults to help them overcome attitudes of helplessness that result from failure, trauma, poverty, medical illness, etc. to help them build positive expectations and engage in life again. And I don't work with rescue animals, but I imagine there's a lot of this incorporated into that as well. But again, I just want to emphasize the more that we understand learned helplessness, the easier it is for us to understand ourselves and other people, how they get stuck, how they might give up on themselves, how they might stay in an abusive job or an abusive relationship, live with an addiction, refuse medical assistance, or again, procrastinate about handling important things. So let me make a couple of just simple suggestions that you can do for yourself if you think you have some elements of learned helplessness in your attitudes. First of all, it's good if we remind ourselves that we have a choice. We might say, I have to go to work. I have to get dressed. Well, technically, no one can make you. If you're an adult, there aren't that many ways to make people do things. Um, now, we may choose to do it, and there are consequences when we don't. But it's good if you find yourself in kind of that passive, helpless way of thinking to recognize, I'm choosing to go to work. I'm choosing to get dressed. I'm choosing to pay my bills, that these are choices we make. Also, it's good if we think about options. Now, if you're trying to make a decision, maybe about a job, and you don't particularly like the one you're in, so you can look at your options. Maybe there are options that 
you would like the job better, but the money isn't going to be what you need or the benefits aren't going to be what you need. It's still important to remind yourself, I'm choosing to stay in this job because it meets my financial needs. If we look at things from a helpless, I have to, I'm trapped, it will intensify our unhappiness. So it's good to remind yourself, you have options. Maybe this is the best option, maybe not. But if it is the best option, it's good to remind yourself that this is the choice you're making for now. Another practical step I'm, I will mention a lot is use a journal to write down negative thoughts, feelings, um, especially about yourself, about your situation. Sometimes if we write these down, they lose a little bit of power. Sometimes if we write these down, we see that maybe what we're saying to ourselves, we don't even completely believe that it's just a little bit harsh. And it helps us understand how we're thinking, how we talk to ourselves, because the way we think, the way we talk to ourselves is either going to make it easier to cope with whatever we're going through, or it's going to make it more difficult for us. So let me pray a blessing for you now from Isaiah 11:2. May the Spirit of the Lord rest on you, the Spirit of extraordinary wisdom, the Spirit of perfect understanding, the Spirit of wise strategy, of mighty power, of revelation, and the reverential awe of the Lord. This is Dr. Tony Cooper. Thanks for listening.